Mara of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheep that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be, say, it will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation.
Now we welcome those who have joined us via the internet for this service of worship here at Piedmont Presbyterian Church. Our New Testament lesson today comes from the Gospel according to John, the 20th chapter, verses 1 through 18. A familiar story, but I invite you to listen to it for what it says to each one of us today. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and she saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. And she said to them, We have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then some Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head, another at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she said this, she turned around, and she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading of his holy word. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in God's sight. For he truly is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <coughs> I'm going to start this morning's meditation with some immortal words. The immortal words of Calvin and Hobbes. Some of you might remember this comic strip with the little boy who had a pet tiger named Hobbes who came alive when they were alone and they had wonderful dialogues. 
together about the state of the world and life in general. Calvin asked Hobbes, why do you think we're here? Hobbes says, because we walked here, obviously. Calvin said, no, I mean here on the earth. Because the earth can support life, Hobbes replied. No, I mean, why do we exist, Calvin asked. Hobbes, because we were born. Oh, forget it. You don't even know what I'm talking about. In our gospel story this morning, we see that Mary was sort of facing the same kind of existential question. Why? Why now am I here? Why am I even living now? The events of the last few days have been unbelievable to her. They had flung her life into chaos. She was living grief beyond belief. Her future murky and dark. And that morning there were nothing but questions looming with no answers seemingly anywhere close by. John tells us that it was the first day of the week and it was still dark outside. There was no hint of dawn at all. For Mary and others, it was not just a physical darkness but also an inability to see and understand that the Jesus they followed was hidden now by the dark events of the last few days. What could she do? She had to return to the tomb. If only to pick up the pieces of her life and try, squinting through the darkness, to make some sense out of what was left. She wanted to be there in the last place that she had seen him. Ground zero, so to speak of whatever life she was going to have to rebuild. All the while, desperately wishing that everything would just go back to the way it had been 48 hours before. After the dreadfulness of all that had happened, perhaps she finally collapsed out of exhaustion and then a few hours later, while it was still dark, her mind started all the questions over again. All she could think of was the memory of Friday, the horror of the cross, the urgent rush to prepare Jesus' body before the Sabbath began. She wanted to go back. That's not an unreasonable wish. Just a few days ago, Jesus was a respected teacher whose reputation as a man of wisdom was still growing rapidly. The possibilities of everything that could happen for the Jewish people under his leadership were staggering. They were on the brink of a revolution. Mary just knew it. And she had given up everything to follow this charismatic leader. What would the future hold now? She didn't know and she couldn't even consider it. If only, if only, there had to be a way back, a way to salvage what was, to put things right, to get back to normal. Stunned and exhausted, she headed for the tomb, back to where she had left the Lord she loved. Once she got there, though, she could see very clearly that the foggy recollection of days just past were real memories, and that, in fact, her nightmare had just gotten worse. All the care and love that she and the other women had put into entombing Jesus' body had been upset. The stone had been moved. The seal of the tomb broken, the great stone rolled.
pulled away. The grave clothes piled there and nobody, nobody at all. Mary ran to tell the disciples. This was a serious turn of events, the looting of a grave. It was robbery. She knew it. And Mary couldn't stop crying. And she came back and stood at the open tomb, weeping and all alone. She grieved the loss of her friend, and even worse, the loss of everything she knew to be true about her life. She had finally recognized who she was. Mary Magdalene, disciple of Jesus. And she couldn't see through the darkness now to know who she was supposed to be from now on. The disciples came and checked out the tomb and then they went away. But she stood there weeping. A stranger appeared finally, who must be the gardener. She was certain of that. He looked at her with compassion and asked her why she was crying. And if he could help her, if there was someone she had lost. Yes, she saw, if you have moved his body, tell me where you have put him, and I will take his body and care for it. Then she heard it, her name, Mary, he said, and in that instant, she knew. That was all that was said, but it was as clear as could be to her. It was him. His voice pierced the foggy, befuddled chaos of her brain, and she looked up in sudden recognition and said, My teacher. In the moment that Jesus called her name, her whole world shifted and she knew that nothing would ever be the same again. You see, there are significant moments in all of our lives after which things are never the same. They may not be quite as clear or as momentous as Mary's, but looking back, we can see their importance nonetheless. For after these events, 